Good morning. Today we're visiting the Embassy of Namibia and we're holding an interview with the Ambassador. Welcome to the Embassy of Namibia in Germany. Gold, silver, tungsten, copper, all kinds of minerals that Africa is producing and exporting worldwide. Um, but we are very good. We have the 2,000 kilometer coastline in the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. So we are a big fish fishing nation. First of all, again, thank you for taking your time. We very much appreciate it. And um, I'm just going to start with the first question. So um, you had a very su successful career. You first served, um, or you served in various critical and um, catalytic positions. Among many others, you ser served first as the first permanent secretary of Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Namibia, then guided the state succession of Namibia from South Africa. Furthermore, your excellency was High Commissioner of the Republic of Namibia. Um, within the Republic of Zambia mm -hmm. and the CEO of Air Namibia. So from these different influential positions, which one did you find the most challenging? Um, certainly the most challenging was maybe uh, the responsibility mm -hmm. of being the first permanent secretary of Namibia. Yeah. Uh, you know, because there were so many expectations. It's a new nation. It was the last uh, African colony or maybe you know, with the exception now of Western Sahara, mm -hmm. uh, was the, uh, before that, it was the, uh, there was great expectations during that time and to assume responsibilities as a permanent secretary of foreign affairs at the age of, of 34 years, I was that young, Very young yeah. that young at that time, so that was a, uh, quite a big responsibility and I'm grateful to our president, the yeah. government, to think that I'm capable of uh, meeting that challenge at that early age. But in general, uh, all responsibilities that I had in my very short career had all their own uh, challenges, respectively. That's what they align. Mm -hmm. It's a very competitive international uh, yeah. business uh, to assume responsibility uh, for the fortunes of our national ally. It was equally uh, interesting, challenging, uh, but in life, you never know, you know, Steve Jobs said, said it so appropriately in a commencement address to Stanford University that uh, in life you can only link the dots backwards. Uh, you never know where life is taking you, but you understand that it had a purpose. There is a purpose for our lives. And if you seize the opportunity that is presented to you, uh, you only understand afterwards why you had you were at a particular position, but very interesting, uh, uh, interesting um, challenges yeah. that all contributed to me growing, but adding value, contributing to my country. So this all led you to the to your current position. So you've been here since January this yes. year. Um, how have you enjoyed the position so far, and what are the main challenges you confronted with so far here in Berlin? Yeah, in in. In a certain way, it was coming back to your roots because I've been to Berlin before in my previous function as a permanent secretary of foreign affairs. Mm -hmm. There were very important um, African-related issues that took place in Berlin. I remember uh, the first meeting of foreign ministers, of, of uh, ministers from the SADC, SADC region together with the European Union that I was heavily involved in because at that time I was also the chairperson of the SADC Senior Officials Forum mm -hmm. that was setting up the dialogue with the counterparts in Europe regularly on officials level but that was the first time that we upgraded the dialogue between SADC and, uh, and, and, and the European Union to a ministerial level so it's an important so it's in a way it's uh, uh, coming back to your roots mm -hmm. I have family ties to Germany. My grandfather on my mother's side was German. So, mm, okay. and coming from this uh, 
Berlin area, uh, although I never personally knew my grandfather because he passed on before I was born. Yeah. But it was, in a way, it's also back to your roots, yeah. to the settled, you know, the Africa, European roots. So it was a very interesting assignment to assume. Nice. So, <clears throat> so um, for, for what reason did you decide to become a diplomat then? One never chooses, you know, what you would, as I said, you know, Steve Jobs, born from Lebanese parents, yeah. uh, adopted by an American family, um, didn't, was not very successful academically, but who built up the biggest, you know, business empire in the world in Apple uh, computer and all of those kind of things. One never knows in advance why you become this, why you make that career choice, you know, but if you remain open, if you remain open and seize the opportunities that life presents to you, you end up and only afterwards you understand why mm -hmm. you made these particular career choices. I love in general, you know, people. I love making friendships. I like, you know, building relations. Yeah. Whether as a student, as a student from that time, I was active in student politics when I grew up. Um, and after that, uh, during the liberation struggle, you go out to talk about your challenges and share those experiences of others too. So that's sort of, it, 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 it led in a certain way to that direction because um, that's most probably the reason why uh, after independence the president decided to, 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 to call on me to organize structure and you know, um, our diplomacy. I was very fortunate in my student days that I was, you know, I met at a meeting um, in Germany here when I was learning my German language um, at conferences. I was spokesperson speaking on behalf of the Namibian people in their courses also during my student life. Mm -hmm. I, I went to study in Geneva. I met um, president of the Red Cross, uh, the Swiss Red Cross, which is the uh, talking about uh, soft diplomacy. Yeah. Uh, very involved in that particular direction. So I worked at an institute uh, during my student years called the Center for Applied Studies in International Negotiations. Mm -hmm. So you get in touch with, you know, global and international diplomatic or act actors. Yeah. So that sort of led, naturally led to the vocation of, of, of diplomacy. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Very interesting. Yeah. So we move on to the relations between Namibia and Germany. Um, so far, Germany and Namibia have a very vibrant economic relationship. And how have the diplomatic relations between the two countries evolved in the past years? Uh, Germany had four colonies in Africa. Mm -hmm. Namibia, Tanzania, Cameroon and Togo. But from those four colonies, there was only one uh, settler colony. Mm -hmm. And that was Namibia, Deutsche West Africa, the yeah. Siedlungs. So it was during the time that people were exploring the concept of Lebensraum, you know, Spain, Portugal, everybody else that were colonial powers, they were uh, exploring how they would expand living space for Europe, Europeans around the world. For Germany, amongst its four colonies, Namibia was the only, only one that was a Siedlung. So a settler colony and that's where they went and most probably the reason why uh, so much uh, cruelty uh, uh, African anti-colonial uh, movements were suppressed mm -hmm. we are talking today about the genocide yeah. but that is the origin because it was a settler colony no opposition to quote-unquote Kaiser yeah. Kaiser uh, laws were to be uh, supported or tolerated and the result of that is today I think Namibia is the country with the largest uh, settlers, German settlers in Africa. They are 30,000, 30,000, we call them Namibians of uh, German origin that uh, live uh, in our country. After independence in 1990, uh, our leaders in their infinite wisdom decided we are not going to build our new country, new nation on the basis of revenge, but we are going to build it on the basis of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And they accepted uh, to recognize 
land that was stolen, but the, the third generation, fourth generation, German settlers are living on to recognize and give them legal title. Yeah. Legal title. And that was out of uh, conviction of uh, reconciliation. Uh, so Namibia has very strong historical ties with Germany. Uh, there are two Bundestag resolutions that refer, most probably it's the only country that is the subject of two Bundestag resolutions that emphasize the special relationship between the two countries for moral and historical reasons. That's how the Bundestag resolution reads it. Moral, most probably because of the genocide that mm -hmm. they committed but 110 years ago, yeah. but that has not yet been recognized, or at least formally not yet been recognized. Mm -hmm. So it is a euphemism for moral reasons is because of that genocide, but historical because of what has happened. Namibia today receives um, almost 80,000 German tourists per year, uh, which is quite a significant flow, uh, flow of, of, of people. One German diplomat told me that uh, uh, there are more friends of Namibia in Germany than people that live in our country because we have a small population, it's only two and a half million. Oh, yeah. Two and a half million and we are one and a half the size of Germany. So it's a huge country but we have a very small population so uh, it holds true for Germany as it does for the rest of the world. We have during our 75 year struggle for independence benefited from the support of, from people all over all over the world particularly from Africa who welcomed Namibians as refugees mm -hmm. gave them opportunities to learn in their schools that's why after independence when we returned uh, we had brought back experiences uh, education that we developed all around the world and we were able to run and establish a a country maybe which is a good reference for everybody in terms of democracy, in terms of tolerance, in terms of freedom of the press, in terms of, you know, gener uh, generally uh, a good intent mm -hmm. to live together and do together now with Africans and former colon colonizers, Europeans. We have 13 tribes, German people of German origin, people of African origin, people of Dutch, South African origin as well, but living peacefully, harmoniously, let everyone do his own thing, mm -hmm. do his own thing as long as we all advance together. It's very nicely said. Yeah. Um, so speaking of the close relationship between the countries, um, would you say that, for example, renewable energy sources and the energy industry in general um, is an arising opportunity for further collaboration between the two countries? Yeah, I, you know, um, we missed well, we missed the energy shift to its new renewable energy. Mm -hmm. We had too much focus on, you know, uh, fossil fuels, yeah. um, carbon, uh, charcoal-driven power plants, you know, like the rest of the world. So. Uh, but there is a new trend towards that new. Namibia as a country is the country which has got the longest exposure to some sunlight in the world. So ideally it's free, it's a God given and ideally we should benefit a lot more by exploiting that. And there are new initiatives now at, uh, starting to put up solar plants, put wind energy mm -hmm. uh, and hopefully in a partnership with uh, Germany. Uh, we should be able to develop that, that industry. We are in the process of talking with the state of Brandenburg, which is immediately around uh, Berlin, but which is most probably the most advanced in terms of developing wind energy. So we talk about talks about developing joint projects to promote that. We're talking about to other federal states about, you know, uh, solar energy, mm -hmm. uh, our university, of science and technology. Now maybe University of Science and Technology has currently got a very interesting project that they are developing with students in terms of developing um, a, sol a solar powered vehicle and a car um, on, on so It's fairly advanced in cooperation with major vehicle uh, manufacturers worldwide because we feel 
with so much expo sun exposure, the longest daylight exposure, yeah. uh, uh, there's a good opportunity to develop an industry, uh, just like little Switzerland is doing with solar impulse, in terms of a solar power plane, plane maybe we could derive the next innovation and um, in that particular area yeah okay so as you mentioned it um, what exactly is your area you would particularly focus on in your time of office is it the um, industry you just mentioned or what is your uh, focus and doing your time term I I hope I hope during my time which is very short four years for an ambassador over mm -hmm. there to establish and develop relations. Governments write contracts, but people implement relations. I think the strongest relations that exist between country, countries are uh, relations that are driven by the civil society. Mm -hmm. When people meet, young people, school, universities, uh, civil societies, churches, uh, cultural associations, when they participate and implement what on the high level governments are deciding those are the strongest relations between uh, mm -hmm. between countries i believe the best examples of partnership between namibia are not started by governments but mm -hmm. are started by ordinary tourists who travel down there and fall in love with uh, an uh, uh, conservation initiative they go and they see what they like what people do with animals what they do with people you know, uh, kindergarten, uh, and I call it love stories, love stories, beautiful. Some of them, I was just recently in Hamburg by a retired German businessman, went and started um, a school for orphan, orphan children. Mm -hmm. That was 10 years ago, we were celebrating the 10th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And in a very remote rural area in Namibia. But uh, that little feeding system, that they had for orphan children that were taken in. They were using Namibian old ladies as surrogate mothers that would look after those particular children, make sure that they have a decent meal every day, that they have a decent meal. That little initiative, after 10 years, has evolved into eight towns or cities where they are feeding 1,400 children daily. And that's amazing. And what started off sort of like a kindergarten is now almost up to grade eight. Eighth school year, very successful, self-sustaining, mm -hmm. uh, because it started as a school and they built uh, guest lodges for people who want to come and visit and see where their money is going. So the income from that, looking after the tourists, is uh, self-sustainably financing this thesis. So it's beautiful initiatives, uh, beautiful love stories yeah. that started off with one pe one person, but in the meantime involves, you know, in Hamburg it was at this time, but uh, it was rewarded by Angela Merkel as a Citizens Medal Award that this uh, business person received. But those are the kind of things that I would like to develop, but with mm -hmm. all 16 federal states of Germany, yeah. uh, that people take, you know, participate in those initiatives in partnerships with regions, with cities, with cultural sports clubs, whatever that is. Uh, that would be a good legacy to hand over when I leave behind, you know, that people have taken up things and they run with it on their own without the ambassador being present because it's best thing is to build relationships between people. Okay, so yeah. as you mentioned, you focus on these relationships. There's a new youth initiative launched by the Bundestag, yeah. which aims to focus on... Last week in Bonn. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. exactly. Mm -hmm. Would you wish Namibia to be part of it? Well, uh, the German youth and the Namibian youth can exchange and <clears throat> Germans are encouraged to go to Namibia and vice versa. Yeah. No, the, all initiatives are, are welcome and I really appreciate particularly everything that has to do with young people. Because mm -hmm. young people are the future. Uh, young people have no hangs, hang ups about the past, they are more future oriented, yeah. no matter what happened. Uh, a very, very beautiful example is uh, France German relations. These people were killing each other. For you know, like, yeah. you know, for centuries they were fighting and killing each other. But over the last 75 years, because of youth, youth initiatives, mm -hmm. partnerships, twinning exchanges, and they, the relationship between Germany and uh, France, for that matter, is exemplary. Mm. Uh, 
You can celebrate, you know, or have remembrance ceremonies about how many people were killed, uh, like uh, the recent event in Verdun, Verdun in France, where within a space of nine months, maybe more than 300,000 people were killed for senseless war that didn't even advance maybe a one kilometer around that. But that's the senselessness of, of or the folly of people at certain ages. Young people, as I say, you know, in hearts, there are no kilometers, there are no divisions. And that's the beauty of it. I think if we use youth exchanges to build strong future relations, you know, that removes prejudices that people develop or acquire. Uh, Nelson Mandela had something very beautiful that, that he said, um, he said, uh, children, when they're born, you know, they don't know apartheid. Uh, apartheid and colonialism and all those prejudices are acquired behaviors that other people import or impose during your socialization, your education. But young people don't have those prejudices. Mm -hmm. And we can all learn by giving them the opportunity to develop the love, the friendships, the genuine, sincere exchanges that they with others. It is a really good initiative that we all in all countries should make opportunities for young people to meet. And it's just we will have a much more peaceful world uh, if we do that. I totally agree. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, you're right. Excellency has have referred to peaceful co coexistence yeah. and to soft diplomacy previously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you define cultural diplomacy and which role does it play in modern international relations? I would say cultural diplomacy is when you put in the foreground um, exchange of ideas, around things that people naturally love, sports, and who doesn't want to play? Uh, not only competitively, but just as a social binding mechanism to have fun. That's the best way for kids to learn culture in terms of music. Who doesn't love music? You know, those are things. And you can engage discussions between people, between nations, around things that they all love rather than the high diplomacy issues where you deal with conflicts and, you know, set. Uh, but tolerance is developed, developed much more effectively through, through that. So putting in the foreground issues that people naturally love, exchange of ideas, exchange, exchange of relations on those level, um, and not and set aside issues around which people feel strongly and they would disagree, my religion, my whatever is. Uh, and then you develop a culture of tolerance. I say, okay, after all, you know, my friend, uh, he comes from a distant country, he loves the same thing. We play soccer, we play uh, tennis, we can play basketball, we could have fun, fun around that. And you discover the real person behind it rather than looking at etiquettes, mm -hmm. etiquettes. And it's, it's, it's not only today, but it is historically. If you take it back, the history of Olympics, uh, it started out in Greece, you know, cities and communities making space on a day to get together around things they love, sports. Mm -hmm. Watch people, there are some, obviously some people are more advanced because they devote a lot more time to practicing and perfecting their, 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 their skills in that area. But any other, uh, any other reason is uh, is a good excuse to socialize, to have more relaxed sort of interactions with people. It is still important. It has always been important. That's the Olympic movement. It's uh, very important. I just had last week a um, Paralympic event here in which we hosted a Namibian Paralympics team. They did exceptionally well. They got nine gold medals, not a small population, but we have people who have a heart, a very strong heart. What an achievement. Yeah, nine gold medals, three silver and four uh, bronze, total tally of 16 medals that they took back. We're very young nations, but I think we maintain ourselves, you know, and it's a good opportunity to exchange. They were crowd favorites. Uh, crowd favorites of a 54 nation event that mm -hmm. took place because they did the, the, the the, the desire, the will to do good that they displayed at that. And these are as much important ambassadors for Namibia than me. <laughs> because on a Saturday they just needed 
two-day event to conquer the hearts of all the all the spectators, on, you know, that were following that event. Uh, they're much more important than I could ever be, be as an ambassador. So. That's the charm of Namibia. Yeah, uh, that's that's it. And there are so many cultural ambassadors, particularly yeah. we had the. Uh, in all fields, musicians, poets. Uh, I went to Baden-Württemberg uh, uh, two months ago to open an exhibition in the museum in Baden-Württemberg about the uh, artwork by young Namibians, maybe 24, average 26, uh, but small from 16 onwards, you know, that are now slowly invading the art scenes with paintings, sculptures, whatever expressions of uh, art that you can find. Um, a very successful exhibition that hopefully we will bring to Berlin in October, in October over there. But those are the people that communicate the vision, the outlook, they address all societal themes about violence, about crime, about equality. Um, they bring it in their own form as an object of instigating a discussion discussion about that, uh, but it's a very powerful cultural diplomacy. Today is most probably the most important and the most important form than the formal diplomacy that we um, that we are practicing, yeah. So, yeah, uh, with regard to cultural diplomacy as a tool to achieve conflict resolution yeah. and peace, mm -hmm. uh, could you provide us an example of a time during which Your Excellency, Excellency were involved uh, in a successful cultural dialogue? Um, I've been all along been involved in... <laughs> yeah. I, love, I, like, I love music festivals. I myself played trumpet. I was fortunate my father. My father was an all-round musician, choir leader, played many instruments, piano, played the violin, and played trumpets, and so on. And uh, he taught me at the age of six uh, to play the trumpet as an instrument that I practiced for a lot, lot, long time. When I grew up, we used to have um, a national trumpet orchestra visit Germany for tours and concerts around Germany, performing in different cities and states together with others. So I, I grew up in sort of a culture uh, cultural environment that promotes that kind of uh, exchange and uh, there is quite a lot of activity that takes place in that field presently. Just simple uh, choirs, music or in, uh, orchestras that travel to Namibia and go and perform free uh, cultural performances around Namibia and then often they leave the instruments behind for the children in Namibia to learn an instrument and to practice that, uh, I, I feel is a, a very potent, you know, when you can get a young person and introduce him to an instrument, a guitar, a trumpet, uh, you know, a violin. Uh, and in the townships all across Namibia, there are many young people, because you should have a, a passion in life. Mm -hmm. You should have a passion in life, other than, you know, the normal career things that you need to do, learn about maths, reading, whatever. But music has has that uh, capacity. If you have a passion about it, you communicate. It gives confidence. Are uh, there are other people who appreciate what you do? Uh, that develops a bit of self-confidence so that you can go into the world and do um, many other things and so on. So uh, we want we want to build on that. Next year is, uh, is if you may know here in Germany. Next year is the uh, Reformation. Uh, Martin Luther mm -hmm. uh, Jubilee, 500 years Jubilee. And there are many intercultural, interfaith events that are taking place to celebrate um, uh, this uh, event, 500 year Jubilee, there will be concerts. But there are three main events that celebrate that cultural event next year. And these three cities where that is going to take place is Berlin, Wittenberg, and Windhoek. That's where the climax of the celebration would take place in Namibia, uh, when the Lutheran World uh, Federation will have its annual annual conference. It's it starts this year in o o uh, October in Lund in Sweden, mm -hmm. where the Pope and uh, interconfessional 
uh, leaders will be gathering to launch the celebratory events uh, because it should contribute to tolerance, greater interfaith unity. At the present moment, people use religion as a divisive, you know, to say my God is better than your God, although we talk about the same. Uh, my belief, my confession is better than yours, although it's the same. Prejudices about the, But that should be an opportunity next year to reduce, you know, and to strengthen uh, you know, strengthen unity, tolerance. Uh, uh, religion, first of all, is a private matter. It's a private matter between you, you and your God. It's not a public, public matter. But that message is the same, whatever the religions are. It's about peace. Religion is a, uh, is a vehicle, it's a message of peace. Peace with yourself, with your environment, you know, and with, with the rest of the world. And hopefully this event next, next year will contribute to greater understanding. We are planning to organize events in Namibia um, um, around that, to bring young people together through music, uh, choirs, you know, that are going to take place, uh, to spread that message of unity. Uh, unity. I think we, we are credible. Namibia is a credible country to be a messenger for that message because we were divided. We fought for 75 years. We had all the issues of division, you know, prejudices, racial pre prejudices vis-a-vis -vis others. But we live, we live as one people today of 13 tribes, Europeans and Africans together, where everybody has his space and tolerance. Uh, Namibia is the only country in which gays and lesbians are not targeted. Uh, but they really are tolerated and accepted for what they are, live and let, let live, mm -hmm. you know, whether with nature and everywhere else. And we think uh, we're a credible messenger in terms of sharing that message with youth all around the world and people all around the world. Yeah. Uh, regarding another topic uh, strongly related to Africa continent and to cultural diplomacy, during uh, its uh, 27th summit uh, in Addis Ababa, mm -hmm. the African Union launched uh, the African e-passport mm -hmm. with the vision to extend it to all African citizens. Mm -hmm. uh, how does Your Excellency, Excellency see this evolution? It is, it is, it is a very uh, important evolution and it is in keeping with the message of the found, founding fathers of Africa. African unit, uh, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, all of those, you know, uh, leaders early that gained early independence and that created, uh, whether it's from Morocco to Egypt down to Cape Town to Ghana, West Africa, East Africa, it was their wish and their desire that Africa can only be as strong as it is united. Uh, there are three countries in Africa at the present moment that have no visa visa exemptions for Africans, all Africans, irrespective of where you come from. And that is uh, Ghana, uh, Namibia, and Rwanda. So if you're an African, you don't need to apply for a, pass a visa to travel to these three countries. You can take up your plane, ticket, buy your plane ticket and land in Windhoek and they will issue you a visa for all Africans, irrespective of which country, no discrimination. And it's a good, it's a good thing, you know, that we should give opportunities to young people in Africa that want to, we are rejected in Europe, we are rejected everywhere else, uh, uh, we need to apply for visas, if you come you're an illegal, but just, we should feel welcome on this continent wherever we want to pursue our dreams, our, our wishes, and our, maybe there's a good opportunity in, in Namibia, maybe there's a better opportunity in Ghana, there's maybe a better opportunity in Tanzania. Why should we always just be looking uh, towards Europe as a place to go and realize our wishes, wishes? It is important to go to Europe, but to go as equals, self-respecting, where you are welcomed. You know, nobody wants to go where you are stigmatized, you're given a label, you're not welcome, etc. And just like as much as we welcome Europeans in Africa, uh, naturally, if we build good relations, Europeans should welcome Africans when they come over there, but as equals to attend uh, studies, to 
attend cultural events where we share our values. We have good values to share, with good stories to tell about ourselves, you know, that we share, share that on, as, uh, as equals. But Africans should do, should practice what they say, what they preach. And an e-passport as a common, is a good idea, but before we do that, we should first of all uh, remove entry requirements for Africans in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, Africans in Africa, and that's the initiative that some of us have undertaken, remove visa requirements so that people can travel on the African country without any difficulties. E-passport afterwards, I think, what is it? Is it an external, just like the European passport? Um, as an identification, uh, I am from Africa. I don't need to hide my African background. I am a European. I don't need to hide my European background. So maybe uh, as a as a next step is an added identification. But at the present moment, you know, if we don't have visa restrictions for Egyptians, for Libyans, for Moroccans, we will make this continent our own. Mm -hmm. We'll be proud that we are coming from that continent that has good things to share, good values, good values, to, values to share, and uh, that should be the spirit in which we see uh, the e-passport and all other developments that afterwards come. Uh, yeah. What advice would Your Excellency give to young people interesting, interested in pursuing a career in international relations or in diplomacy? Uh, I have, I have a saying, you know, that leadership is not restricted to people that lead a country. Mm -hmm. Leadership is practiced on all levels, and a student can be a leader as a student. The only thing, only thing that comes with leadership responsibility is that you should be. You should be yourself, the change that you want to see. There are many things wrong uh, that could be improved on, that could be better, and it's on all levels. And if you can be the example of the change that you want to see at home, in terms of your relations, with your brothers and sisters, with your family, with your parents, um, it's good to criticize, but it's better to do you know, and to improve. And it's not easy, it's challenging. But once you practice that at home, you take it to your school, you take it out into your community, into your city. And once you do that, then the world is an oyster. You do what you love, what you love. And then with it comes responsibility. People are very discerning. They notice who does something good, whether it's your peers as students, if you are pleasant to hang around with, more people will join you, they will hang around with you because you're always constructive. You don't just see the negative side of things, but how could you could contribute to improve so that there are more positives than there are negatives in life. And if you do that, I think the world uh, diplomacy 